Thank you, Paul, for that generous uh, introduction, too generous. And uh, I'm grateful to the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies for the invitation and for the preparation work done by Krista Hegberg and Nicole Frischette. FDR and the Jews was published in March of last year and has generated a good deal of uh, response since then. I regret to report that not all reactions were positive. Um, I want to start by talking about two messages um, sent to me by unknown readers. Um, they were not the worst, but uh, they were certainly not the best. The reason I'm singling them out is that they say something to us that may cause you to listen to the rest of my lecture with slightly different ears. So, one person wrote, all you have to do is go to the Holocaust Museum to see that you're wrong. Well, um, I'm not sure this lecture is what he had in mind. And since our book offers a mixed judgment on Franklin Roosevelt, I can only guess at what he thought was wrong, but I would guess that he thought the positive elements were wrong. The second person claimed to have very specific information that in 1943, Franklin Roosevelt was presented with aerial photographs of the areas around the extermination camps and identification of their functions and he simply ignored it. The person wrote, I can think of no explanation other than indifference or anti-Semitism. Well, this one I couldn't let pass. I wrote back that American planes could not reach the extermination camps during 1943 and could not possibly have taken such photographs. He then wrote, well, maybe it was 1944. I wrote back, all of the extermination camps other than Auschwitz-Birkenau were shut down by 1944 and we know today that there were some photographs taken accidentally of the extermination camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau by reconnaissance planes looking at the damage done to industrial facilities in the region. But the photo reconnaissance specialist who finally found these photos did so either in the late 1970s or the early 1980s. And he wrote an article for a historical journal on why photo analysts during World War II had failed to identify Auschwitz-Birkenau as an extermination camp. At this point, my correspondent stopped writing. Still, let's think a bit about these two emails. Both of these people had read things or learned things about the Holocaust. 
And the second critic could only explain Roosevelt's behavior through negative motives. This tells us perhaps that we have a problem. Call it the problem of success. There once was a time when people avoided the subject of the Holocaust. That time is long past. Now we have not only a multitude of scholarly works about the Holocaust in virtually every country affected, some of them geographically distant, but the Holocaust has become a part of popular culture and there are fictionalized movies, novels. Some people complain that there is too much attention to the Holocaust. So people know or think they know a good deal about the Holocaust. But some of those people blot out the context in which it took place. The war and the climate of the times. They are harder to re represent visually in museums and in the mass media. This problem, plus an increasing tendency to emphasize moral issues, moral choices during the Holocaust, creates an unrealistic picture. This is history chosen selectively, in some cases inaccurately too, to support a moral or a political point. How can we do this better? I can only tell you how a historian, in this case two historians, have done it. We tried to place Franklin Roosevelt in the context of his era, American politics, diplomacy, and the war. Not to bury the Holocaust and not to excuse everything that Roosevelt did. But if you want to understand Franklin Roosevelt, you have to go back into his world. Roosevelt did not see the Holocaust the way we have come to study the Holocaust. The word itself was not commonly used for what we understand it to be today. He perceived it in blurry form and as part of the war against evil powers and other elements of that war influenced how he reacted. So let me start by talking about the flow of information out of Europe about the Holocaust. And then let me shift to a picture of Franklin Roosevelt's agenda and his world. Not his whole world, not his private world, and not even the war in Asia that he had to deal with simultaneously. But let's say the world in Europe and North Africa that conceivably influenced how he responded to what we call the Holocaust. There were, of course, reports almost from the beginning of the Holocaust, which most